good morning. Good morning. How's everyone doing? What? <laughs> that was pretty quiet, but yeah. Um, it is good to be home after a very quick flying trip that we made to see a couple of our kids, or see the kids, a son and a grandson. But um, we actually got back on Thursday. Uh, a long ways to drive, but we made it back. Um, we will today actually start singing our hymns. Because while we're in masks, I ask that you bear them, especially while we're singing. Um, and we will get back to doing the liturgy, singing the liturgy as we progress through this. Um, I want us to not get overconfident at this point. It's really hard for me to try and do this. I also don't know that you can hear me as well when I'm, when I'm muffled with the mask. Um, I know that during this week while we were while we were gone in just what we did, that I understand more about maybe why it's important to wear the masks. And we do it not for ourselves maybe as much as to protect everyone else. And so I ask that we continue to practice that, that policy or practice in our own lives as we gather around with people. So we will start today singing all the verses to the hymns. So um, we're all wearing masks, so we're in good shape with that. Uh, please know that on Wednesday evenings, um, we're doing, I'm walking us back to the beginning. We're going through Genesis. Um, I'm having fun because I'm not using a translation of the Bible that I typically use. I'm actually using one that I've never used. And it's kind of fun because it's not uh, the same words, it's the same story, but it's not the same words. And I'm discovering things in Genesis in the first two chapters that I hadn't caught before. And I think it's just because we hear the words in just the translation we always use, and we forget there's another maybe way to hear the story. So um, as soon as I do it on Facebook Live, I put it, uh, we get it on the website pretty quick on Wednesday, so if you're not on Facebook Live, you can get it pretty quick. It goes on the website as well. Uh, I think all the announcements, um, and just so, point of information, I do not know the Evan Bob's funeral, Bob Fairchild's funeral will be. I'm guessing, I'm guessing, <laughs> it could be any time in the next month. It'll be a Saturday, but we just don't know when um, everyone can gather. Uh, Minnesota's not under the same guidelines we are, as far as their um, COVID issues, so we're, we're having to deal with some family for Kevin to try and get here and that kind of thing. So we're kind of having we're on a little bit of a whole pattern of knowing when we will celebrate um, Bob's, Bob's journey. So hang with me. I don't know either. So <laughs> I'll let everyone know when I know. Um, Ron and I, in fact, laughed while we were on vacation because Ron laughed and said, you know, um, how do you have a vacation when you're, you've been on the phone, you've been doing your emails, you've been doing your Bible studies, even when you're gone? And I said, because we never get a vacation from God for all of us. We don't get to take that. And, and it, it, for me, it was, it's not a burden to do that. It's just the reality of life um, for how we do things. But um, God is good, and um, we'll, we're going to, uh, so you all will know information as I know it. I don't know what else I can say. Uh, hold, hold all of our families and stuff in our prayers. I, I think there's a lot more. I know I have another friend that we don't think it's COVID, but um, whether it's bronchitis or whatever, she is now on about a fourth week of being extremely sick. We don't think it's COVID, but she can't get over it. So um, there's a lot of stuff out there, not just COVID. To deal with um, people are dealing with bronchitis and pneumonia and all sorts of other respiratory and cardiac issues. Um, the stress of the summer is definitely there, I think, on all of us. So hold, hold all of our, our friends and neighbors and our prayers as we move through this week as well. Okay, let us stand and we will begin speaking our liturgy for now. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, 
Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have gone into sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us. So that we may find in your world and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and forgives us all our sins. As a call and ordained servant of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we will sing a beautiful Savior. Mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the 
Father, receive our prayers, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. Almighty God, we thank you for helping us to speak of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy, live according to it, and grow in faith and hope and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
Our second lesson is found in the eighth chapter of Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who walk, who live according to the flesh, and set their mind on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the thing of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through the Spirit that dwells in you. Hallelujah. Wherever shall we go? We have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it. While all the people stood on the shore, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell among the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Listen, then, to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word, and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. These are the words of our Lord. Praise you, O God. You may be seated. Matthew. 
Never in our lectionary do we ever talk about or preach on Matthew 12. It gets totally left out of the lectionary readings. I don't know why they thought the writers of old, when the canon was put together, left that piece out for us. I don't know that it's a good idea, because I really think to understand 13, which has its own issues, 12, chapter 12, really has to be understood, because 13 is really an answer to the questions that are raised up in chapter 12. In chapter 12, we really start to get the opposition to Jesus. And his death is plotted. So we're already getting some of the uprising and some of the stuff of what Bertina is trying to help us understand in a very familiar way. As we go through chapter 12, we even have the Pharisees are seeing Jesus as the link of um, Beelzebub, and they're against him totally. They think the Pharisees think he has committed the unforgivable sins. The plot is building on top of one another. In fact, in verse 34, chapter 12, we even get, you bring a viper, how can you, who are evil, say anything good? For out of you overflow the heart the mouth speaks. He's really talking about the unfruitfulness of what the Pharisees are. Jesus is being set up in chapter 12. He really is. We even get the signs of Jonah and, and talking about the evil generation and they're wanting a sign that, they're, that they are, you know, who they are and and Jesus answers, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign, for none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And we know the story of Jonah in the belly of the whale for three days and is kicked out and he moves forward. But, so, wait a minute. This is all about unbelief. For the Pharisees, they do not believe. So the whole beginning, the whole pre- so the parable of the sower is about unbelief. But we wouldn't know that because of where we kind of start, kind of in the middle of a story. And I think we need the for forefront of that story. So I think maybe, why do people not believe? How can we meet, how can we meet Jesus? The answer is about the story of the sower. The story is, a, is that there is going to be unbelief. There will be in our time. We know that the word is put out there, and in a culture that we live in, even more so today, maybe, we are starting to hear and see the signs of unbelief. And I, I believe firmly, along with many others, that if we as faith-based people don't start to say something, we are losing more than a little bit. We are losing our souls to a world that would take it and keep it and do ruin to us. Do I think there needs to be a spiritual uprising in our community and in our world? Yes! Because we don't want to believe that God is the God of creation who will rise us up out of ashes and out of ruin and bring us forth to new life. We tend to want to sit on our hands and often on uh, during the week and not say anything and not do anything because it might create a ruckus. We might have a problem. We're going to have a bigger problem if we don't start saying something and telling our story of faith in a world that wants and needs to hear it. I had to chuckle. While we were with Austin with our grandson, his roommate, well, Austin, 
Austin. Austin kind of cracked me up too because he's like, well, he doesn't go to church very much. And, and there's some issues, and I understand what happened in, in Austin's life. I baptized him. I know he's a child of God. I know he's been saved. I know God is watching over him, no matter where he is at in his journey. He's not even 20 hardly yet. I don't even know if he is 20 yet. I know he can't legally drink yet, so that part I know, okay? Definitely, I know that, I can't remember. But I had to laugh at his roommate. As we were talking, he said, he said, uh, yeah, Austin was telling me a little bit about you guys. And you're kind of that church one. Now, do I have to not say any bad words or can I, can I like be real? He said, I don't go to church. <laughs> it's okay. You know, he said, well, I didn't know if I needed to go get baptized really quick because you were going to be here. And I'm like, no, it's okay. It's okay. Now, maybe we need to talk about that journey a little bit more. No, it's fine. It's okay. He's like, well, was Austin baptized? I said, yeah, I know Austin was because I baptized him. But I said, it's okay. You don't have to get worried about this. But it's funny about how people want to react, and I didn't even bring it up. He didn't even mention it. I wasn't going to. I'm not in my house, but I have to chuckle. Because as we moved into the, our readings for today, I don't know if you noticed, there are a bunch of verses even taken out of the reading for today. I mean, we're missing like uh, about seven verses that don't even get put into the, into the lectionary reading for today. So we get the parable, and we get the parable, not even sure if it was the same writer, for both of those. There's some question whether they are the same writer. Because why did Jesus need the parable explained again? If Jesus is the one that told the parable to start with. So okay, so chapter 13 answers the questions about unfaithfulness that chapter 12 raises for us. Okay, so we get into 13 and Jesus went out. I love it. He went out of the house and he sat by the lake. Now, I don't know that Jesus was really there to uh, thinking he was going to preach or whether he was there for some respite time. We don't know. All we know is that a whole bunch of people gathered around and wanted to hear the story. And so in order for Jesus to be heard, he gets in a boat and he goes out sitting down and starts to tell the story of the sower. Now I want to say, maybe this story should make us all a little uncomfortable, and maybe everyone's uncomfortable now and they're gonna and not not come to church because you've got a rebellious pastor who says, We have got to start telling our story and be faithful. We have to start doing what we talk about. I hope not. I hope that instead of being intimidated by what we're called to do, that we will do it as efficiently and effectively as each of us can. At our council, we've talked about more than once, is it effective and efficient to put an ad in the paper? No, it's not, and we know that. We know that the best place to tell the story is by word of mouth. Inviting people to come and be part of a journey that we will put people on and help them through. We know, uh, and, and we were laughing this morning a little bit about it, um, is it effective and efficient for churches to have high ceilings no, it's not. It's tradition, and the reason we have these kind of ceilings that are peaked, I mean, outside of the fact it's a normal roof, 
is the symbolism is, seriously, is that we are in the belly of a boat. That's why churches started peaking and kind of being, have noticed some, a lot of them are a little more rounded. It is because the symbolism is from the belly of a boat. And that as Jesus launches us, in a sense, well, but the problem is, is it any more effective and efficient to have high ceilings? Uh, we probably need three ceiling fans, and it would help our utility bills. Maybe. The next question, if we want to talk about effective and efficient, efficiency, and that's kind of what this text is all about. So of the seed is about how effective and efficient is, are we? At what number is the magic number that we have to have in the building to worship? I don't know. That I have no clue on. A lot of congregations are starting to have to think about it. If we put this back into farmer ter terms, how efficient and effective is it if as a farmer, you went out and just swung seed. Well, it's probably not very much. I think every farmer would say, well, it'd be kind of stupid to go out and just swing the seed around and hope some of it comes up. That's not real wise use of seed. Because some of it will land in the marsh, and it's going to be drowned out. Some of it's going to lay under the rocks or the thistles and not be viable to get to because it's going to burn out. Some may land where I want it to and may actually grow. But I'm going to switch that around. For you and me, it's not about swinging seed out there except for one kind, and that's God's words. I think you and I have to unashamedly Sow the seed everywhere we are to plant those seeds not knowing what will happen. Now for Nick and Austin, I have to say that we were watching a, a couple of shows while we were there that I'm sure that Ron and I would not watch on our own. For a little bit, probably over the back. But you know what? I'm not going to condemn those young men and, and, and what they were watching. It wasn't that bad, but I mean, it was not what I would watch. It was definitely not G level. Let's put it that way. Okay? I don't want to make that. But, you know what? What I thought was interesting is the conversation was there about faith, maybe about the some thoughts need to be put into some things about where they are in their lives as 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds. Maybe they have to think that through. I didn't, you know, we talked about it a little bit. In fact, then we were sitting around the table having dinner. You know, when you go to Florida, you think about having seafood. I thought this was funny. I wanted fresh seafood. We had no lobster. Hmm. We didn't get fresh, but we got no lobster. But it was fun to sit around the table and hear the conversation about Patrick or Austin. Do you remember when? Do you remember when your dad? Do you remember? about grandma and grandma, hearing the stories, and faith was part of that story that got wrong. Okay, so unashamedly, two young men got to hear the story of God in the midst. I think mean, that's where we have to land ourselves. Friends, we have to start telling it, maybe more so in this time, in this age, and in what's going on in our country than ever before. We have to start sharing that story in our midst, wherever 
wherever we are, with our families or whatever. You know, I, I do want that. I am amazed at the number of hits that both on the website we get and now we're getting on Facebook. Last Sunday, David, David your service had like over 150 views on Facebook. It's amazing what we are seeing happen. And I'm going to tell you, it's not about all church people who are watching both the Bible studies and our worship time. It is those people who are, I have to tell you, there's some people, I don't know who they are, who are watching what we are doing. To hear a story, and I get comments back, and I get notes back. I get a lot of notes about what I put in the paper and about the weekly things that you all get. Because I am not afraid to tell our story. We have to all come to that point that we are not afraid to tell our stories, to tell our story of faith. See, I think the sower of the seed helps us understand that in some ways we could say, well, you know, and I've had people say, well, why do we do baby baptisms when then no one wants to come to church? And they, the family may or may not bring those kids back for years. It's like, oh, I'm not going to stop baptizing because someone doesn't come back to church immediately. That was the case I could never baptize grandchildren that I had. In fact, I wouldn't have baptized the good chair people if I expected that. God's grace is not about to be counted on what we deem successful. God's grace is about what he says and does in our lives. I am not the bearer and the weight bearer of how much God's grace affects other people's lives. See, we cannot waste God's grace. It's not ours to control. Someone asked me years ago, well, you know, when you're doing communion, how do you know everyone's like, Done confession. I said that luckily is not mine to do. That is not mine to do. It is God's grace that takes care of that. Friends, our lesson today is really about unbelief. If we believe, we will tell the story. And we may throw that word out in rocky places. It may be thrown out in the muck of life. I'm working with a, with a person right now. Struggling in life. Struggling in a lot of areas of her life. She doesn't have a church home. Not yet. She's struggling. And could I say it's a waste of time? That was one of the many phone calls that were being made as we traveled. I was making phone calls back and forth, trying to make sure things happened because I couldn't do it in person. I could say, well, you're not a church member anywhere, so therefore your life isn't valued and we're not going to worry about it. Nope. Not going to happen. It's not going to happen that way. God's words were never meant for us to say we have a commodity on it and it's only one way and only one time. God's words were to be sowed out there randomly in all that we do. 
place to pick up the handle when it lands on hard hearts. He will hear glad. As those, as we come and make our confession each week, God knows what's in our hearts and will take care of it. The sorrow of the sea, yeah, it's about understanding God's word. It's about realizing that God's word is not private, but for all of us. For the world to hear. Maybe we have to be like Luther. That we have to say, well, at least we're going to do something. We may have to do it and sin boldly in doing it. Or maybe we have to listen to Nike and just go do it. Maybe it's time we unleash the words of God's grace into our communities and into our families and into everyone that we know, every place that we are, and let God do the rest. Amen. We will sing hymn number 67 in the gold book, uh, Blessed Assurance.
And you sent your son to liberate people from sin. By the resurrection of your son, free us from our fears. Assist us to grow in your grace and mercy. Light in us the flame of your love so that we may share your love with others and help others know Jesus Christ. Strengthen us for the work you call us to do this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, be with all leaders in the world. Continue to guide them and encourage them. Give them strength and wisdom to hear your words of hope and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, be with those who govern in our location. Be with all teachers and administrators as decisions are being made. Give courage and mercy to all who lead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, guide and strengthen all pastors, that as we serve, that we may hear and listen to your call and to your people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, be with all who care for our people, for EMS, for frontline workers, for hospitals, home health, doctor's offices, care facilities, fire, police, and all others who serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh Lord God, we ask for you to continue to have open wings for healing, for Stan and for Lily and all others we name in our hearts this day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, walk with open arms around the family of our prayer child as they are making plans for his celebration of life. Be with Lance and Kevin and Richard and all their family that they may know your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us come together and pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Saying our offering. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew our life spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of our salvation, and the whole nature of your spirit. Jesus said, The first commandment is, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is, you shall love the neighbor as yourself. Amen. Amen. Let us sing, uh, we plow the fields and scatter the page 362. <laughs>
you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks.